Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining from. And thank you for listening to this episode of CPA Review and More with your host, Phil Yeager. I'm your producer and director here at the Yeager Studios, Rob Medford, and together we are bringing you the number one podcast for CPAs and CPA candidates. If you're new to the show, I'd like to be the first to thank you for checking us out. We're excited to have you as part of our listenership. If you're here because you've already heard our show and you're a continued listener, we thank you for the ongoing support. It's always greatly appreciated. If you're in the market for a CPA review course or simply want to know more about what Jaeger CPA Review has to offer, check out our website at JaegerCPAReview.com or call our office and we'll answer any questions you might have. The link and telephone number will be in the description of this episode. Here at Team Jaeger, we're excited to tell you about our new Jaeger CPA Review subscription format. It's the same great Jaeger CPA Review course that you know and love on an all-new, month-to-month, no-long-term-commitment subscription format. But without any further delay, I'm going to pass the microphone on over to your host, Billy Jaeger. All right. Good. Good evening. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate it. And Ron, how are you? How are you, Phil? Nice to see you again. Uh, thank you. Same here. And uh, I'm sort of coming in. I apologize. I don't know if you mentioned to them. We had terrible rains here. Uh, although I wasn't here for two weeks, but the rains were terrible. And they caused actually a lot of flooding. I don't know if anybody saw that on the news. Uh, uh, the people were actually, it looked like they were on rowboats on the top of their cars. It was really terrible. So anyway, well, anyway, thank you, everyone. This is Phil Yeager, and uh, I'm sort of coming in. I don't know exactly what was being discussed, but go ahead. Well, we, we just welcomed everyone to the session. We kind of held off on getting too much in the weeds, so we can kind of roll into some of the topics. We have some questions coming in, um, and I know that this kind of we've branded this particular seminar, webinar, uh, about... CPA exam basics, the CPA exam 101, things that you should know if you're taking the CPA exam. And I'll kind of pass it over to Phil Yeager to talk about some of the high level things you should know when you're just starting out taking an exam or say you've taken a, an exam with another review provider. Maybe these are things you didn't know. And um, now you're here with us and we can kind of get you on the right track to pass this exam. Thank you, Megan. Um, well, the first thing is, and we've discussed this before, is that the exam now is based on these AICPA blueprints. It is no longer based on just the content specifications, where they used to say no investments, no business combinations. They weren't that specific. Now they're very specific in the tasks that they expect you to know. So, you know, you must follow the blueprints and once again, I must say that our books do integrate the blueprints, the current blueprints, so you never have to worry that we are behind as far as putting the blueprints in our books. Then, once you get the blueprints and you get our books, or I don't want to say get our books, but I'm being a little presumptuous there, but you know, our course, we include the blueprints. And then you have to study. No matter what you do, you have to study. Set up a schedule, put the time in, and you got to put the time in. You got to give up something. I remember when I was studying for the exam, every day I would go to the library. All right, I'd set up a schedule for myself, I'd go to the library, and initially it was a little difficult to keep to that schedule because I hadn't studied in a long, long time. But once you get into the sort of the rhythm of it, all right, you'll start going to the library, and the library is the best place. Don't study at home. There's too many distractors at home, as far as I'm concerned, one of which is the refrigerator. That's a real distractor. Uh, so you want to stay away from that, because what you'll do is you'll find a good reason to get up every 10 minutes and go and eat something. All right, so go to a place that's quiet. Make sure it's air-conditioned, obviously, and also it has to have Wi-Fi now. That's the second thing. And you can call me up. I will give you a schedule. I'll set up a schedule with you. What you should do initially for the first week. 
And then you'll contact me a week later and we'll see how that schedule is working. And I promise you that if you follow the schedule that I will set up with you and you put the time in, you got to put the time in, you will pass this exam. This exam is so passable, right? And actually, to me, it's easier than when I took it because it's only doing one part at a time, which means that it's not dependent on the other three parts. Every time you take one part, you don't have to worry about the other three parts. And don't study for more than one part at a time. That's the key thing. And also, this is our suggested, I don't know if this was mentioned or not, Megan, but you know, we suggest to start with the financial accounting, then you can go to auditing, and then third, do the regulation, and do the BEC. Now, there's one part you can actually go against that schedule. You could start with the regulation, all right, if you wanted to, because the regulation really is not dependent on any of the other parts, all right? So if you feel you're really good in taxes, business law, then I would take the regulation. And the regulation is predominantly taxes. That's what it really is. And, and they spell it out. You look at the blueprints. They tell you specifically what they want you to know. And it's so specific that if you learn that, that's all you have to learn. Because they state, you want to study for this exam? Make sure you know the blueprints. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's the whole secret to this. So anyway, um, I don't know what else I can say on that. Other than well, one of the things I wanted to do, um, if I can here, since we have um, some folks here with their screen share, um, and this we may have to pull out of the audio recording if we share it, but I wanted to just show folks on this webinar tonight what it looks like um, in the AICPA blueprints. Um, if you go to the AICPA org website and you type in CPA exam there's a button there for CPA exam um, and you're going to go to the examination content tab there's actually quite a few resources that we recommend that you even if you're just starting to study or if you're down the road a little bit go there tonight and take a look at these resources because they're from the people that actually developed the blueprints and so what you're going to need to do is download those blueprints and um, Go look through them, read through all of the information, and each item in that blueprint is going to dis actually tell you the task that you need to know, but not only just that task, but the level at which you need to know it. And I'm having a little difficulty sharing my screen here. I'll see if Rob can share on his um, side of this um, webinar. But basically what, what you'll see is actually a column of each level task and there'll be a check mark for each level for that specific task and you'll notice that a lot of the tasks are at the remembering and understanding level and what you'll see from that when you're actually on the exam those tasks are going to be in multiple choice questions the ones that they're going to be testing in a task-based simulation will actually be listed on the blueprint as either application analysis or evaluation and so, especially those evaluation questions, those, those tasks are only actually listed on the audit portion of the exam. And those are very easy picking for the uh, examiners to test on task-based simulations and audit. They're at the highest level in the hierarchy of understanding and critical thinking. And so those are the ones that they want auditors that are going into this profession to know 100% of the time. So, that's kind of how to read the blueprint when you go and download it. Also available there are other resources like a practice exam. It's not a full scale exam, but it'll give you a simulation of the user interface. It has task based simulations with answer explanations. Those types of things are all available from the people that develop the actual exam. All right, back to you. Uh, Phil. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, the, a lot of, you know, we all get the same, we all pay a leasing, you all, I'm starting to sound too south here. Uh, uh, anyway, we pay a royalty fee to the ASCPA for the use of their multiple choice questions, which are roughly about 5,000 multiple choice. And also, all right, we get a few task-based simulations released to us, not that many. And those are generally the ones that, you know, I would say, they have given on the exam that they don't count. They're pre-test questions. But 
overall, there's very few task-based simulations released to the providers. So therefore, don't look at a course and say, gee, they have 100 simulations to practice with. Those are all author-constructed. And I've asked people, well, you know, they'll say, well, you know, we had 100 simulations. And I say, okay, was any of that stuff on the exam? And they said, no, they were very disappointed. And I say to them, well, that's because those are made up by the companies who actually provide the courses. Mm -hmm. And people were very surprised. They thought that, you know, these companies had some in with them, all right, mm -hmm. and they could get all these simulations. And the answer is no. If that was the case, that would be totally illegal. So, you know, they're actually author-constructed sims. So the best thing to do is, all right, know how to do couple of simulations. They give you, as Megan said, some sample simulations in each part of the exam. And all you have to know is this. If you know the information in the blueprints, what you are doing is you can take that information, look at the exam as a template, and you'll take the information and insert it in the exam. That's really what you have to know. And as long as you know what the different types of sims are, right, which you'll learn from that AICPA website, then it shouldn't be that hard. All right. All right. And Ron, Ron, do you have any comments on that? By the way, I must say, uh, Ron, can I just say one thing before you talk? Yeah. Ron and I are actually the boys from New York. That's the way I like to talk about it. Ron and I are both from New York. So you may hear that disgusting New York accent that we still have. All right. We try to get rid of it, but it's sort of like stuck with us. Right, Ron? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we have uh, that that New York twang, that Northeast twang in, of our, course. in our voices. We're going to address a little bit in this, in this presentation, too, about whether you should be studying multiple choice questions or the task-based simulations that we can provide you, what combination we believe is most effective. I can see that as one of the questions from the students. So that's another thing that we will address for you. But basically, Phil is right. I see a lot of questions in the webinar, in the chat, about I can't find time, I'm too old. I have failed multiple times. Hey, listen, I failed two parts of the exam for the first time I took the exam, okay? I wasn't discouraged. I was close, and I knew what, to, I, knew what I did wrong, and I knew what to study the next time, and, and I was able to pass them the second time. So, you know, you can't get discouraged in this process. You have to keep going, keep studying. Hopefully, you've heard about the blueprints. We cannot emphasize enough the importance of following the blueprints. Trust me, the AICPA tests by the blueprints, okay? And another thing is for those of you I see, you've taken the exam a few times, you've failed. You know, you also have to be cognizant there are questions on the exam, as Phil mentioned, including mobile choice questions, simulations, which they don't even grade. They're just test. They're just trying them out, so to speak, okay? So, you know, when you're taking the exam, you can't get discouraged as you're, as you're taking the exam itself. So we will get to some of your questions here in a minute. I see a lot of good questions here in the chat, Phil. Okay. I, Megan, do you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, so I think that brings up a good point in test-taking strategies and, you know, not getting discouraged if you get to a topic that you don't know and spend a lot of time on it. Um, Phil, how long would you recommend a person spend on each multiple choice question and how should they manage their time on the exam? They should spend a minute and a half roughly on each multiple choice. I looked at the exams, a minute and a half, and that's on financial reg and also the auditing. Yep. Now, as far as the task-based simulations go, all right, Interesting, and I, I really looked into this, and I think it's a true statement. I mean, it's just, it's my opinion, all right? But this is what I feel. You have roughly eight simulations on reg and financial, and you really have this. This is the breakdown. If you take a minute and a half per multiple choice, you use up approximately 90 minutes on the multiple choice. Now, with a four-hour exam of 240 minutes, that means that you have 150 minutes left to spread amongst eight simulations. Now, if you do the math, it's about 18 minutes per sim. Now, I honestly believe this. There may be seven or eight responses in the simulation that they're asking you to do. But if you get 60% or more of the responses correct, 
I believe it shows them that you know the topic and they will generally pass you on the exam. And the reason I say only 60% is for this reason. You really can't do that whole simulation in the 16 and 17 minutes. It's impossible, all right? And they know that. I'm sure they know that. So you got to spend 16, 17 minutes. And if you do that, then you will do every simulation. And once again, you want to get 60% or more of it. And you don't have to do an exact order to get to 60%. Just get 60% of the responses. And if you do that and you don't leave out any of the sims, then you have a real good chance of passing the exam. Honestly, I've spoken to people who have trouble. They say they run out of time. Um, they've left sims blank. You leave a simulation blank, the ICPA can't determine what you know about that at all. And really, each sim is a separate topic. So, you know, that's my approach to the exam. All right? So that's what I think people need to do as far as timing. Yeah, I think that's... I agree with that. And I think that the key is don't ever spend so much time on one question that you run out of time as a whole. That typically will cause you to have that be a practice test. And then you'll have to go in for the real thing. Um, and try, I, I encourage candidates, especially if they've tested several times on the same part, to get the I've failed mentality out of your head. This is not an exam where failure is like it was in college. Failure's not what it was in college where it's going on your permanent record and it's in your GPA. And consider any time you go in there and you don't get a passing score as a practice exam. And we had a question from David, would you get questions um, on the exam a second time if you went in to sit for it during the next testing window? The likelihood that you'll see the exact same question is fairly low because their test bank is so large and they have so many questions that they test occasionally you might see the same one. Um, I know that we have had candidates indicate that they may have seen some again, but I wouldn't expect to see a task-based simulation twice. <laughs> so, Is that question on taking an exam twice within the same window? Oh, no, but that's another topic that we get asked yeah. a lot. That's a great topic. Bill, do you want to chat about that? Yeah, I mean, if you fail the exam during a testing window in financial accounting, you can't go back and take financial accounting again during that testing window. Therefore, it avoids getting the same questions twice, okay? Yeah. I mean, then, you know, they try to think of everything in spite of what we hear about the SCPA, whether we agree with them or not, okay? They think, you know, and say, hey, you're not going to be able to take financial twice because this way there's a pretty good chance you won't see that question again during the next testing window. Yep. So. Yep. All right. So let's cover a couple of the other. Um, we've kind of already talked about the three secrets that we had announced that we wanted to cover. So we've covered, have you heard about the AICPA blueprints? Um, you can get those from AICPA.org. We've talked about best order to take the CPA exam in and why. Um, a little bit more about why FAR would be first, Phil. Um, I know that a lot of the folks in the session are taking FAR first. Well, people take FAR first because FAR is the, the I think, has all the information except for regulation and accounting. For example, when you take FAR, all right, then you'll take auditing. Well, Correct me if I'm wrong, Ron. You're auditing the financial statements, correct? And FARS feeds auditing automatically, Bill. Because they, they do ask still generally accepted accounting principles. Yep. You have to know that for the auditing, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yep. So if you're connected. Yeah, and if you don't have a good knowledge of uh, generally accepted accounting principles, which you get from FAR, you may have more trouble with the auditing. And by the way, you don't have to work in public accounting, in auditing, to pass the auditing part of the exam. All right? So, you know, that's really financial. And also, this is why you want to do financial. First is because when you get to the BEC part, which has the written communications, all right, they can ask you a written, communica uh, written communication question on financial, auditing, or regulation. So you want to leave that for the last all right, when you actually do the BC written communication part. And by the way, the written communication, I guess they look at uh, sentence structure. They do look at your grammar. Uh, and also, 
They also look at the information you come. They want to make sure you understand what the topic is that they're asking a simulation, I'm sorry, a written communication on. Now, if I can mention this, uh, the parts financial reg, they will give you a research, you know, there's research questions throughout that. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can't spend more than three or four minutes to do a research question because, all right, it's not worth a lot. And I don't know anybody that's ever failed the exam because they didn't do the research question. And you got people, they spend 20 minutes on these research questions. And you know what that does? That takes away time from the rest of the exam. So if you don't get the research question, whether it's asking you a financial accounting standard or in taxes, a certain IRS code section, all right, don't panic. If you can't get it within three to four minutes, just walk away and let it go. It's not going to make a big difference as far as passing or failing. So anyway, that's my speech for tonight. Thank you, everyone, that, and have a good I think, no. uh, <laughs> I think that's very helpful. Well, and then the last topic that we kind of had announced we wanted to chat through, and we've covered just slightly, but drilling multiple choice questions. I know that a lot of our competitors have tens of thousands of multiple choice questions. And from our philosophy, we feel that drilling multiple choice questions is not the best way to study. So Phil, why do we typically say that to candidates? Well, first of all, uh, twice a year I attend uh, it's called a PAC. I don't know what's this, but it sounds like an animal, a PACA, you know, an alpaca. No, it's a approved course providers meeting where we meet with the AICPA. All right. The director of examinations is there, Mike Decker. And he basically, you know, gives us ideas. He doesn't tell us what's on the exam. That would be nice. But he gives us ideas. And he said, don't memorize old multiple choice questions for this reason. The exam is no longer testing you on memorization and only memorization. The simulations really are testing you on whether you understand how to do a task. Now, in order to understand how to do a task, all right, it's not memorizing old multiple choice. So don't go crazy. You know, actually, if you do the multiple choice, there's roughly about 5,000 for the four parts. That is enough, all right? Don't go, by the way, anything in excess of that, that a course gives you 11,000 multiple choice, those would be author constructed questions. And author constructed questions are as good as saying, well, this will be on the exam. I'll pick that out of the air. All right. Hey, they don't know what's on the exam. So what we do is we say, we use the questions and those questions really are on lower level thinking. They're not on the critical thinking that they want today, but they're still good to do just to emphasize and re, I'd say, uh, make sure you understand a point or a concept. Now, I can tell you this. We get multiple choice from the ICPA on leases. We had to take all of those old lease questions, which were based on capital leases, and we had to rewrite them so they were in conformity with the new lease rules. There were no new lease questions. So that's what we do. We use those questions, and we do that all the time with the multiple choice that we're given. All right, we, the question start, you know, changes. We have to rewrite the question having to do with the new tax act or anything like that. And I'm sure it's the same thing with auditing, all right? They rewrite the questions. No, well, we, they don't rewrite it. We rewrite the questions mm -hmm. so that adhere to the, what, general accepted auditing standards that are in effect now, all right? Now, Ron, you've been doing auditing. You are the auditing maven, as we call it, the expert, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, for those who don't know what Maven is, that means an expert, okay? All right. Now, Ron, uh, you've seen these auditing questions, right? Yes. Over yes. Yes. All right. And this is sort of a loaded question, but do you feel that uh, with our books that we've actually taken the old questions and rewritten them so that they're in conformity with the present pronouncements? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. And, and also, Phil, we have rewritten them to emphasize what the blueprint is also testing, okay? For example, right now, critical audit matters is a major subject in the auditing section of the exam, okay? And what is that, Ron? What is critical auditing matters? Okay, so, for example, you're doing a simple audit of a small local company, let's say, and 
you take a look at their accounts receivable and you realize that half of their accounts receivable are over 120 days old, for example, okay? And this is, again, a loaded example. Well, you as an auditor are auditing the balance sheet and let's say accounts receivable are 50% of the total assets of this small company. You know that's gonna be a very critical audit matter, audit matter that your audit program and your audit approach and your analytical review, everything else is really going to have to focus on before you can express an opinion on those financial statements, okay? So again, this is a loaded example. And another example where the, uh, in auditing where they're really focused is fill what we call risk assessment, okay? Now, critical audit matters is somewhat similar to risk assessment, right? But for example, if it was just in the newspaper that your audit client's uh, IT has been compromised and there was a big article in the paper last week that someone accessed through IT uh, all of the customer information for your client, that should probably be a warning signal to you as an auditor that you need to review IT general controls for that particular company, okay? So, so Phil, really on the auditing exam, there's a heavy focus on risk, risk assessment, critical audit matters, and more importantly, what do you do when you find them, okay? The, they, the ASCPA assumes you understand what a risk is, but the other question is, what do you do as an auditor once you run into these type of risks? Megan, I wanted to ask you, on the BEC, yeah. which you know, yeah. uh, what, what do you feel the people have the most trouble with in that uh, section as far as? Yes, the the challenges I think people have on that section are the topics that they don't typically cover in more than one session in your college career. So BEC is obviously a catch-all topic. It has corporate governance, it has economics, it has IT, it has cost accounting, it has all of these classes that you've taken. So the topics that I think that most candidates struggle with, and if you can get really well, uh, um, your understanding is beyond the other candidates taking the exam, you're in great shape. Variances is one of those topics that I think a lot of people struggle with. If you can understand and look at a question and, and figure out what the efficiency variance is, what the, all of those things very quickly, I think that's one area that you'll excel on BEC in um, compared to other candidates take, that take the exam. The other area I think that it depends on your background. If you took economics really early in your college career versus later, and it's been a while since you looked at that stuff. I think economics can be challenging for a lot of people um, just because it's been so long since they've taken a look at that type of macro microeconomics concept. I think that both IT and corporate governance are very memorization heavy. If you're an older candidate and IT is not something that you grew up with and it's something that you've learned as an older candidate, that can be challenging for those folks. I think that if you're a younger candidate and you're in your early to mid 20s, then the IT section usually isn't as challenging. And it's just learning about how as an auditor and as an accountant, you would discuss IT. Um, IT typically, just to take the veil off of IT, it's not, you're not learning how to code. You're not doing anything super technical. The goal of this exam is to help you be able to communicate in a room full of executives what IT functions need to be doing and how it interacts with the accounting information system. All the interfaces, what the controls are as an executive and later in your career, though that terminology will be very important. So that's what they're focusing on is an understanding, a very general understanding of IT. And then just the base level IT general controls and IT application controls and all the interfaces that have controls around them so that you can manage risk from more of an executive standpoint than the IT specific function. And so I think that helps a lot of those older candidates that haven't had as much exposure to this from an academic sense kind of take a step back that it shouldn't be a scary topic. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those that'll continue to evolve over the next couple of years as they start to figure out what they want to test. But those, those are probably the high level areas that I think people struggle with. Um, and the only other one that I know we get quite a few questions about has to do with financial exchange rates. And just that's one of the calculation heavy 
topics on BEC. So if you have something where you're um, looking at the buying power of a certain exchange um, rate, if you're going from one country to another and you wanted to use a certain um, amount and there's a certain exchange rate, those types of questions um, where they'll say it won't be calculating it. It will say if this increases, what happens to X, Y, and Z? And that type of big picture understanding, it takes it beyond just application and it goes to analysis level. And I think that's where folks, when it gets to those types of calculations, it gets confusing. <laughs> and in a, a minute and a half on those multiple choice questions, sometimes it's just too much. So I think that folks, when they come out of the exam and they've struggled on that, that's probably why. And uh, based on the finance, uh, make sure you know, for example, what puts and calls are. Yep. That's been asked on the exam. Also, yep. uh, hedging activities. Mm -hmm. All right. How you hedge, you know, so that if you invest in one thing poorly, you buy another investment, which will make up for that loss. Hedging. Yep. And by the way, that has nothing to do with landscaping, that hedging. <laughs> <All right>. True. <laughs> yeah, you don't go like that. Okay. So, yeah. you know, that's important. And um I think that's really it. It's sort of a uh, potpourri of a lot of subjects. Yeah, lots, right? lo and, and that's, I think, the testament to how broad this exam is, and I think why it's so scary. So just trust the fact that this is not something you're going to learn in a night. It's not something you're going to learn in a weekend. You can't cram for this. And if it's taking you a few sessions to get the understanding of this information, give yourself the kindness and the grace to get through all of it before you go in and sit for it. And that's okay. And I think a lot of the questions, we'll jump back to some of these questions that we've had coming in. A lot of the folks that we work with work full time. And this is something they're trying to do to advance their career, but they also work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And coming home to do CPA review is not their ideal fun activity. Um, and so I guess, Ron and Phil, what would you say to candidates who are doing that or in the grind in this kind of emotional struggle of doing this every day? How do, yes. you, how do you recommend they get motivated? Yes. Yes. What, so what I did, Megan, you know, it, it is a grind and I've seen some questions here from the participants about having families and children and everything else. I faced all of that too. Okay. And what I did when I studied for the exam is, you know, I waited till the kids went to bed at night and everything was quiet. And I spent like one, two, three hours. And then on the weekends, I always tried to dedicate a few hours. I was taking a review course in those days live. So I would go to that review course and I just, I just made sure I carved out a few hours every day for a few months, you know, and studied diligently. I also want to point out something I tried to study the topics I knew were going to be tested and I didn't really understand very well. Okay. In other words, I gave myself credit for the stuff I think I knew and I could do well on it if it was on the exam. And I really focused on the topics where I thought I was weak. Like Megan mentioned some of the topics not covered very deeply in my studies or in school. I could see that in the review course material and I would really focus on that stuff and ask questions and, you know, do, do look up more materials to help me understand it. And the, the advantage of all of you have today is you have the internet, right? You have Google, you have search, you can find videos on YouTube. There are so many places to go to supplement your knowledge on the materials you may feel uncertain of. And Phil, maybe you could fill in what you did when you did it. Well, when I took the exam, first of all, I'd been out of school for seven years because I had no intention of being a CPA. But I went to work at a community college and got out of the corporate public accounting sector after being in it for five or six years. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with this accounting degree? So I said to myself, well, uh, I enjoy standing up in front of people and talking. And I thought the best time I had in school was, teach, was taking public speaking courses. I like to stand up there and speak to people. Um, in fact, I'll talk to anybody. I'll stop them on the street and they won't even hit me in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, you know, I, I thought, well, I'll try teaching. And I taught part time at Fairleigh Dickinson, one or two classes. And then I said, there it is. I like it. And I applied to community colleges on the East Coast to pick certain places. 
and I ended up teaching at a community college, but I didn't have a CPA, and I figured I better get a CPA because they may be head of the accounting department, believe it or not, and I was the only one, all right, who actually had an MBA and a CPA at the time, all right, and no one else had the CPA. I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. I had an MBA and a bachelor's degree in accounting, all right? No one in my department had CPAs. So I was the first one to take it, and I figured I better have it. I'm head of the accounting, all right? And after I took it and passed it, everyone else followed, you know? So you should take that CPA because you, it gives you more flexibility in your life. You know, I look at it this way. I never would have been able to start a CPA review course without a CPA. I wouldn't have been able to do... Um, uh, financial planning. And I, you know, I got the certified financial planner designation. I don't, I didn't keep it up, but you know, I, I tried to get uh, designations that would give me credibility. That was sort of an expert in the field. Although we can never say we're experts. Was that, is that still a violation of ethics to say we're experts in the area? I think it depends on the state. Um, it's, it's one of those noodly things since all the states dictate that. Some states you can say you're an accountant um, if you're not licensed. Some states you can't. Um, yeah, it's very state-based. <laughs> no, but when in Maryland, you couldn't call yourself an expert. You couldn't say you specialized in something, all right? But even so, I started a practice. I did taxes. I enjoyed taxes because I got to talk to people, again, about their tax situations. So all I'm saying is, all right, you should have a goal. Have a goal and say to yourself, well, why am I going for the CPA? Now, if you say I'm going for the CPA because I want to put this up on the wall and admire it every time I pass it by, all right, that's not a good reason, right? Uh, now, by the way, I never even put up my certificates, believe it or not, on the walls. I didn't want to cause anything, holes in the walls. But I never put up the certificates, all right? But, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, I'm glad I went for this. It gave me, and that's the whole thing. My goal was this, to get it because I was head of in a program, all right? Now, your goal should be, why are you going for this? Ask yourself that, all right? If you can't find a good reason, then you probably shouldn't be studying for the CPA exam. But if you say to yourself, you know, I have a job now, I'm not getting any place, and I know that I can't leave there and look for another position because the other positions now say CPA preferred or CPA required. So there's the reason. And every time you get discouraged, just remember that reason, okay? And that should keep you going. You got to push yourself. Um, you know, we have it where people call us up, right, Ron, you, Megan? All right. And do you, Ron, do you find you have to give a, a sort of psychological advice to, I mean, these people are discouraged? Absolutely. You know, I think my first phone call with a lot of um, candidates is I, is some of the messages I'm seeing in the Zoom chat, you know, about being worried, concerned, um, perhaps I'm too old to take the exam. Um, I don't feel confident going into it. How do I remember stuff that I studied three months ago? And I always say to them, you know, believe me, we all go through this. Um, you got to go in with a degree of confidence. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn, you know, that first time you take a part, Hopefully you do well on it. Maybe you get in the 70s. Trust me, if you get in the 70s or in the 60s, you're not far away from passing that part, okay? And you have to have the confidence that you can come back that second time and pass that part and move on to the next part. So yes, definitely, Phil. That's half of my discussion with uh, especially first-time candidates or ones that have not passed a part and are now looking for advice. Megan, have you had any interesting calls from people about being discouraged and they want to quit? Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of, we get to see kind of behind the scenes with candidates. And I think that there's a lot of folks when they're at the office, they can't open up about that. And so they're very isolated in the fact that they're not feeling very confident and they don't know what to do about it. And so I work with folks, say for instance, um, we have a candidate that she's told all of her friends that she's taking this exam and she wants to make the time for it. So she's told people, you know, I can't come to this birthday party because I'm studying for the exam and she's made a commitment to it in her life. But then as a result of that, when she tells people, Hey, I have this exam on this date, then people do ask, how did it go? And she feels a lot of shame telling them if it didn't go well. 
And again, that's why I don't want people to use the word failure because that's really not what it was if she didn't get a 75 on that particular exam. It really was just a practice for the next round of this long process. And I, I, the thing I think that I hear from candidates most is that it is an emotionally draining process. And there's just not a whole lot of people you can talk to about it. And no one wants to hear about it because they don't understand how a test can be quite this hard on you and take as long as this particular exam takes. Because there really isn't an exam, even in other professions, I would say that quite mimics the type of commitment that you have to have to get through it. And I kind of wanted to go back to that, like how much of a commitment on a week to week, day to day basis, if you're working full time, if you're trying to do other things, if you have a family, I think that one of the biggest challenges is when you are supporting other needs in your household and you are trying to do this as well and you're working, how do you balance it all? And Phil, what is the typical guidance if you're working full time, how many hours per week and per day should you try to commit to this exam? Well, I always tell people Monday through Thursday night, after you come home, try to do two hours of studying, all right? Whether it's watching videos and do additional questions, whatever. Then I always tell them take Friday night off. You need a Friday, you know, you need a day off from this. And then Saturdays and Sundays, that is your best day to study by going to the library and spend three hours maybe in the morning, take a lunch break and maybe do two to three hours in the afternoon, Saturday and Sunday. That's what you have to do. All right. That's the way it is. And, you know, the minute you start making excuses, well, I have to go to the store with my daughter because if she doesn't, if I don't go there, she'll write a book about me when she gets older. All right. Called Mommy Dearest. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and also it could be Daddy Dearest too. You don't know. But seriously, yeah, you know, you can't, those are excuses. All right. You got to have the support. In fact, I think someone just uh, wrote a question about it, or comment that, all right, you have to be, you have to have people who are supportive of you. And unfortunately, all right, your husband, spouse, whatever, may not be supportive because they don't understand what you're going through. Um, uh, your family probably doesn't understand what you're going through. So therefore, if they are not supportive, all right, call one of us. We'll be supportive of you, okay? All right, in fact, contact Dr. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but anyway. No, but that, I think that that's yeah. the key. And, and I, I think a lot of... Um, Support that you're getting there. There's, we have a student group that you can have study partners within the Jaeger program. You can connect with people both on LinkedIn and Facebook and to have some um, peers to work through things with. But also if you need a little bit more of a pep talk, I mean, we all love to do that. You know, we want it. We want you to feel like you can do this. And if you want to chat with us about your personal situation, that's what we're here for. And um, we can get you to that next step. Uh, because there, I think that um, we've found that a lot of folks may get review um, course materials provided by their company. And maybe those courses didn't have any type of support like that. And then again, we've kind of talked about it. If you're going through and, and maybe not everybody's taking the exam in your cohort of, of people at coworkers, all of those folks, they might not understand from that sense or that maybe they do understand and they're passing and you're not, and you don't want to admit to them that you're struggling. All of those things we see on a very common, it, that's common, that's not anything you should be ashamed about, but maybe you need to chat with us one-on-one -on -one so that we can figure out maybe what exactly is happening that's causing you to have a struggle. And is it, is it a technical thing? Is it, an emotional thing? Is it something where you're just having anxiety and it's not, you're not able to get to the next step because there's a testing anxiety? Or is it something of a combination of the two? And where you need to learn the technical skills a little bit more, and you also need to get your head in the game and be able to perform on test day, and maybe it's part of both. Let's see. Uh, do we have, what other questions do we have that we can yeah, have? that we can cover here? So let me. Yeah, pull there's a good question one. from There's a good question from Nirav. He says, 
do you think I should spend more of my review time doing multiple choice questions or the task-based simulations in my, in my um, CPA review study program? Good question. Uh, my answer to that is, all right, go through the blueprints, read a blueprint, and then ask yourself, all right, what would I answer to that thing? Okay. All right. And that's what you really need to do if you have not gone over the blueprints. Now, going over old multiple choice, remember, that's based on old content specification. It's not based on the blueprints. So you may be doing multiple choice on areas that used to be tested on the exam, but they're no longer tested, okay? All right, and also, all the task-based simulations you're possibly talking about, I told you, there are very few released by the ICPA to the providers. So all those task-based simulations you're talking about are author constructed. And once again, I've asked people when they come out, all right, what did you do? Well, I did a lot of task-based simulations I practiced. Did you see the material on the exam? No. Why? Because it was the author constructed questions. All right. The author constructed, they don't know any more what's going to be on the exam than the man in the moon. Okay. So just remember that. So my answer to you is I would make sure I'd go through the uh, blueprints on the subject you're taking. All right. And just give yourself like a quiz and say, all right. Uh, they might say, uh, calculate the uh, operating activity section for the indirect method, okay? They might ask you for that. Now, you say to yourself, well, what is that? You know, well, I start off with my net income, all right? And I have to make adjustments to net income to convert it from accrual to cash. Now, they can, might give you documents, all right? So what documents would you have to? Well, net income would come from the income statement, all right? And you have to add back non-cash expenses, subtract that non-cash income, all right? Where do you get those? Well, you get them also from the income statement. So you have to know what documents you need to answer what you're looking for. That's the key thing now. You have to know what information you need so that you can answer the question. And I always give this analogy. If I was going to my client and I had to prepare a statement of cash flow, I wouldn't say to the client, by the way, give me what I need to prepare the statement of cash flow. All right. I would have to tell the client, I need this, I need that, I need... And that's what they expect you to do now on the exam. Uh, so, you know, so my answer to that is, which wasn't a short answer, was don't waste your time doing a lot of task-based simulations. Do the ones from the AICPA website. All right. And Megan said, you go to AICPA.org. There's a little search box. Put in blueprints 2019. Yep. All right. It'll take you to those. And do the simulations that are on the AICPA website because they are released by the AICPA. Yeah, yep. And just so for your awareness, if you're taking this over the course of the next year, they update the blueprints every six months. So they'll be releasing the blueprints for January in the next couple weeks. So you'll see the ones um, from that started July 1st through the end of the year posted now, and that's what you should be studying on for all the exams that you're gonna be taking in the next couple months. And let's see. So um, we had a question a little bit more about Jaeger CPA review and some of our products and services, um, learning a little bit more about what we do in addition to these webinars once a month. Um, Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the different services and products that we offer? Yes, um, uh, consulting services. You know, you're down and out, we'll tell you what to do. No, uh, we, we have written our own books. And once again, as far as I know, I don't care what these other courses say. We're the only ones who integrate the blueprints in the books. We just don't give you the blueprints, all right? There's no point in just giving you blueprints because the blueprints don't tell you the material under what the, the task is. So we integrate those. Also, um, we have our own multiple choice. And by the way, I told you, the other courses get the same multiple choice, but this is the difference. When they give us the multiple choice, they just give us answers, A, B, C, D. That's it, all right? The solution to why that is the correct answer and why the other ones are incorrect, we do a very detailed explanation. And that's really good to look at. You know, if you get the answer wrong, you got to have detailed explanations, all right? Instead of just saying, well, A is correct because of this, therefore B, C, and D are incorrect, all right? That's not really a good explanation. Um, I think also, and let me just mention, at the end of the course, all right, because a lot of people say, gee, I forgot what I did early on, all right, 
we have a cram course that has been around for 30 years, okay? And it's good for this reason. We did statistics and we found that the people who took the cram went up five to 10 points more than they normally would have. And the cram is a review of everything you covered in that subject without going over questions again. And it is not the same material, it's not the same video as the regular course. We really go over and review everything all over again, all right? And then what you do during that cram is you write down, well, I understand this. Oh no, I don't understand that. And yet we'll tell you to go back and look at it. Um, I'm just trying, and also, all right, we now have, let me see, we have the, we now have, should I mention the, um, the other thing we now started, Megan? Yeah, the, definitely. Uh, we have a subscription plan now, okay? All right, and if you actually get it, you get subscriptions to, I lost the people, you get subscriptions to People Magazine? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, no, the subscription plan is good. If you just want to use the course for a month or two and you don't feel you need to own it, all right, an inexpensive way is this. We give you everything with most of these. Uh, we have three levels, gold, silver, and bronze, which is on your screen. Now, we are running a webinar exclusive discount, all right? And this is for anybody watching this webinar and also anybody who's a friend of yours, a relative, we will also honor this discount. And what it does is on our gold level, all right, we're gonna give you $45 off the first three months, $15 per month. The silver is the middle one, right? So, and normally we give you, we give you uh, PDF files, but we don't give you a printed textbook. Is that correct? correct. All right. Yeah. So now we are giving you these under the silver plan, now an actual hard copy of the printed textbook. So you don't have to pay for it. So that saves you about $65, but you still have to pay the shipping. All right. And then our lowest end is the bronze plan. Now in the bronze plan, all right, we don't give you the PDF files of the textbook. If you want them, you have to pay for them. But under this exclusive discount, all right, we are now giving you the PDF files of the textbook. So all you have to do is download it, print it, and you have the textbook. All right, that was not free before this discount offer. So, you know, take this into account. And this will be on until what date, Rob? Uh, it will be Thursday, I believe that's the 19th, 18th or 19th. And this will be shown where, as far as? Um, they can find the information for this on the Jaeger CPA Review Facebook page. Um, we will have the exact flyer that you're seeing here with the promo codes, so you don't have to write them down from here. You can take the time, look at the website, figure out which one you want to actually use, and then pull the uh, promo code directly from the Facebook page. Yeah. And I want to say this. There are actually, there's another course who has a subscription plan. So we're the second course into the market on this. So you know what? Look into each one separately, all right? I'm going to tell you that ours is the best, no matter what, because I'm biased, all right? But really look into the subscription program. And maybe, I think the other one might be a few dollars cheaper than ours, just a few dollars. But don't look at it just because it's a few dollars cheaper. Look and see what they're giving you and make sure everything is current and up to date. And also make sure that any program actually includes the blueprints. And what this does is it basically gives you everything else. You get the cram, all right, on the gold plan. You can actually have free access to me, unlimited. Is that correct? All right. uh, you and the other instructors on the instructor hotline. And the message board, all right. Now, on the silver plan, all right, they have access to me initially. We set up a schedule for you, all right, and then you can call me the following week. It doesn't come with the unlimited access to me, but you can deal with the other instructors. You can use the message board and the bronze. The contact you have with me is to basically, I'll set up an initial call with you, set up a schedule and then follow up a week later. All right. But you don't have unlimited access to Phil Yeager. Not that it means anything, but you still have access to the other instructors. Correct. Absolutely. And, and the message board. Okay. So anyway, I think it's a good deal. You might want to look into it. We've been doing this now. How long, Megan? Well, I, I don't want to say quite exactly, but it's over 40 years. Um, 
since you started the review. No, no, I'm talking about I'm talking about the. Uh, oh, oh, the, 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 the So we launched May first, um, and so this is new to the market, and we are a very competitive price point. So just so that you know, the gold pricing. There's an introductory offer that we're doing now that it's. Um, 149 a month and you can cancel after the first three months um, if you decide that it's not for you or you want to take a break for whatever reason we understand life gets in the way occasionally but don't let it be an excuse that you can cancel we want you to get through this exam <laughs> um, and do it the right way and so that we hope that you know if you are struggling this will be the thing that keeps you in the pipeline and gets you to that CPA one of the things that we value here at Jaeger CPA Review is that there are lots of candidates out there that never actually finish the exam. They just start and drop out. And we want to help get those people to that next step because I know personally, and I think everybody on this call knows, getting your CPA license, getting that acronym after your name is a game changer. It changes, like, to me, it changes your socioeconomic status. It's that big of a deal. And if you can dedicate the time to do that, and it, I mean, in the grand scheme of your life, a year, two years, it's not that long and you have it for the rest of your life. So don't let a couple failed exams deter you from going in and getting this done and please let us help you along the way. And we're very open to talk through your problems. So I hope that this has helped you. Um, are there is any there, other... Are there any last minute questions yeah. that might be extremely important that we should mention? I'm trying to see here if there's any other burning questions before we cut off the webinar tonight. By the way, uh, Ron has been with us, you know, not a long time, but I'll tell you, he's one of the best auditing people I have seen or heard. And I must tell you that, Ron, you do an excellent job. All right. And since, you, Ron, since Ron got the CPA, he went from being a millionaire to a billionaire. That's how his socioeconomic <laughs> status has changed. Okay. All right. And Megan, by the way, way, your dress is very nice tonight. Oh, why, well, thank you. <laughs> yes. I tried to dress up for the occasion. I can see that, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, Ron, you were saying before I cut you off, I'm sorry. No, I mean, because of all, all because of auditing, without it, Phil, I would be nothing, to be honest. Auditing is my baby. I love You auditing. love to make those tick marks on the work papers. Isn't that correct? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, for you attendees, please do not hesitate to contact us, Megan, Phil, myself. We're here to help. We're here to answer questions. And we want you to pass the exam. There's nothing more fulfilling to us as a supplier, as a service provider for this product, and, and what we do for candidates, we want you to pass the exam. Nothing is greater than that email we get from you people passing. And Megan, you want to mention the calendar we have so that... Yeah, we, so, yeah. so if you're a subscriber at the gold level, you'll actually be able to schedule time on our calendar using a very stream, streamlined process in Adaptive Pass. You just look at the instructor's calendar that you'd like to schedule time with, pick a time that works for you, and it'll actually, um, within two hours of, you know, advance notice, you can have a call with an instructor. Um, it's a very seamless process. We've spent a lot of time developing that kind of Uberization. It's not exactly Uberized because you get to pick who your instructor is, but we thought that that was one of the things that candidates need most. When you're struggling, you'd like to talk to someone as soon as possible. So we tried to be able to connect accounting professors to our candidates that need help. And that's also, the calendar is used for our regular you know, course besides the subscription, all right? That's the way you would actually set an appointment with the regular course. So I don't want you to think it's just the subscription. It's the regular course too. Great. Anything else we need to talk about? Yep, I think if you have any other questions um, to reach us, you can actually email um, Sonny at JaegerCPAReview.com and he'll route it to the proper person to answer your question. Um, and I hope that this was valuable to you tonight. And we plan to be here next month with some more questions and answers for you. If you have any in the meantime, reach out to us. We're always here. And anyway, thank you everyone for watching tonight. I hope you uh, felt this was helpful to you. We try to make it helpful. And uh, I want to thank Ron again. 
And Ron did not, Ron, did you tell everyone where you live? Missoula, Montana. Yes, Missoula, Montana, yes. And uh, <laughs> actually, Ron is from Brooklyn. Was it Brooklyn, Ron? Yes, the Bronx, very just, close. You know, the Bronx? Yes. Yes, okay. Wrong bald guy, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I called you Rob, okay. Anyway, yeah, there's Rob, okay? All right. By the way, they were for a different mother in another century. Okay? Anyway. <laughs> All right, Ron, thank you very much. Well, and, if, and if you wanted this recording, if you had to drop off early or you joined in late, um, Rob is actually going to be posting this onto our podcast. If you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. We, it's called CPA Review and More, and it's available on iTunes and everywhere else you get your podcasts. And we cover not only CPA review topics, but also topics that we think are of interest to CPAs and young professionals. So we encourage you to join in, listen. Um, they're, I think they're fun and entertaining. Phil does a nice job, so in Thank my you. humble opinion. <laughs> so and on, I, we, have a new, we have a new podcast every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, every Tuesday, we have a new Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern, it'll post. Yes. So please go ahead and like and subscribe that, and uh, let us know if there's any topics you'd like us to cover on the podcast. So I want to thank everyone for watching again, and if I don't get a chance to speak to you again, have a wonderful, terrific summer, and we hope to see you again for our webinars in the future. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day or evening, wherever you are. Once again, I'd like to thank you for being the best part of CPA Review and more with your host, Phil Yeager. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show to share your story, we want to hear from you. Send me an email to the studio at podcast at yeagercpareview.com. If you're enjoying the content that we're providing, we'd greatly appreciate it if you'd submit a review to the Apple iTunes podcast app to let us know how we're doing. If you're in the market for a CPA review course or simply want to find out more about the CPA exam and what Jaeger has to offer, check out yeagercpareview.com or call our office and we'll answer any questions you may have. The link and the phone number will be in the description of this podcast. Here at Team Jaeger, we're excited to tell you about our new Jaeger CPA Review subscription format. It's the same great Jaeger CPA Review course that you know and love on an all-new month-to-month, no-commitment subscription format. Check it out today. Once again... My name's Rob Medford. I'm your executive producer and director here at the Ager Studios. And until next time, take care and be audit you can be.